Okay, just by a show of hands, how many of you would consider yourself to be um, a cat person? There are more of you than I expected. Um, I need to proceed with caution. Um, how many of you would consider yourselves to be dog people? All right. Well, there are probably a few more of us than there are of them. It's like um, Android and Apple when it comes to phones. I, I met a guy yesterday who used an Android, and I was like, wow, I didn't think you guys exist, like leprechauns or something. And sure enough, they're there. So just like cat people. Um, I have a dog, and um, she is a, uh, I've told you before, I have no idea how we ended up with a standard poodle, but we do I have a standard poodle, poodle named Daisy, Daisy Duke. Uh, she goes by Mrs. Duke. That's her official name. She prefers for us to call her that because she's very formal. Um, she doesn't bite. She judges. She looks down her long snout disapprovingly and lets you know that um, she doesn't like what you're doing or what you're about. Now, we have another little dog named Baxter, a little mutt. Not 100% not sure who his dad is. Um, and, uh, you know, Baxter is a pretty good little dog, a little tiny dog, and, and we buy him bones. We spend way too much money on, on dog snacks. And um, they have the game of bones in our house where you give them each a bone and then they go into this combat mode where they hide the bones, they steal the bones, they protect the bones, and, and um, it's all they do. Joy has to take them away at night, finally, because they'll be in the middle of the night, you'll hear, Rah! you know, they'll be like on each other, like trying to steal the bone as soon as you go to sleep. And so I was there with Daisy doing an experiment, a human nature, dog nature experiment. Daisy's on the bed and she's got her paw on the bone. And um, I lean over on the bed and I'm just kind of petting Daisy and she looks at me, she flips her head on my hand, pushes my hand away from the bone. And I said, Daisy, I'm not gonna take your bone. I bought that bone for you. I gave it to you. I don't want your bone. And she was just looking at me. Now she won't growl at me and she won't try to bite. She judges, she was judging me. And, and I, I, I was looking at her again and I thought, you know what? She thinks I'm gonna steal it. And so I put my hand up to pet her head and she flipped my hand off of her head and she hun hunched over the bone. And she protected it with her body where she put both paws over her bone and her head down over the top of it and was daring me to take it. And you know what? I didn't want her bone until she told me not to take it. <laughs> and then I decided I was taking that bone no matter what. I said, Daisy, do not bite me, but I'm taking that bone. And I reached over and I grabbed the bone and I took it from her and she was so mad. And the only reason I wanted it was because someone told me I couldn't have it. And... And I did. I'm ashamed to tell you. I, I destroyed the evening for my poodle Daisy by stealing her bone. I gave it back. But we all have issues with the rules, don't we? We all do. Sometimes we don't want to do something until somebody tells us we can't, and then that's the very thing we want to do. Or the opposite sometimes is true. And in Jesus' day, people were no different. They had issues with the rules, and there were a group of people who loved rules. They were rule specialists. They loved to follow them, to make them up, to take things in Scripture that weren't really there uh, and uh, add to it, subtract from it, and they came up with all, all sorts of guidelines and rules and regulations and things to do. And so you had people who loved the rules and then people who wanted to break the rules. And a lot of the rules they wanted to break just because somebody told them that they had to follow them, and there was all kinds of stuff going on. And in one particular instance, Jesus was teaching and one of these religious leaders stood up who loved the rules and said, how is it that we're supposed to go to heaven when we die? That's a paraphrase. And Jesus began a conversation with him where he answered according to the Old Testament law. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus began another facet to this conversation. And, and um, they landed on the concept of love your neighbor. Now, immediately, the teacher of religious law, the expert in the rules, thought, how are we supposed to love people who are so different than we are? How can I love? Oh, let me ask a different question. Who is my neighbor? Because maybe Jesus would define neighbor the same way that the Jewish people had defined neighbor in the Old Testament, where it became just a small subset of, of the population of people among the Jewish faith who were so good at following the rules that they made it a profession, a hobby. So he said, Jesus, who is my neighbor? And Jesus answered with a story, a parable, the parable of the good Samaritan. Now you may remember this, this parable, this story. The story never happened, but Jesus really told it. And Jesus told it to explain to the people who were listening, both those who were trying to figure it out with a good heart and those who were trying to trap Jesus and make sure he followed the rules. 
Jesus said a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and was beaten within a half inch of his life, left for dead. And a priest came walking by and saw the man who needed help. And the priest scooched up against the rocks and as far away from the person as he possibly could, passed by on the other side and walked away like he'd never seen it in the first place. So the crowd who was listening would have been a little shocked because a priest should have been somebody who would have helped another Jewish person, perhaps. Then a Levite came walking by, a person who worked for the priest. And sure enough, the crowd would have thought that this Levite would have helped the man who was beaten within an inch of his life. But in reality, this Levite backed up against the wall, scooted down as far away as he could, didn't want to get involved. The crowd, a little more concerned. This is weird. Where's Jesus going with this story? And then Jesus introduced the next character. He said, a Samaritan came walking down the road. Now the crowd would have booed. Remember that? Samaritan, he's probably the one who beat this man up in the first place, or at least his people did. They'd been trained to hate the Samaritans from birth, passed down from one generation to the next. Jews and Samaritans hated each other. Political opposites, religious opposites, Many would kill on sight the people who were different than them. And Jesus said, a Samaritan comes walking down, sees the man, acts with compassion, goes over to the man, bandages his wounds, puts him on his donkey, and takes him to a hotel and pays for his care. Not only that, but says he comes back and checks on him to make sure that, in fact, his care is, is appropriate, is good. So the crowd would have been shocked and scandalized that Jesus had said this. Why would any self-respecting Jew allow themselves to even be treated or helped by a Samaritan? Well, the Jew couldn't help it. And the Samaritan was moved with compassion and the crowd was stunned. And Jesus looked back at the teacher of religious law and said, who was the neighbor? And Jesus ended with the command, the man who showed mercy was a neighbor, go and do likewise. So the problem is, how do we go and do likewise? How do we live as a neighbor with people who may be so different than us that many of us have been trained to be suspicious of them or if not, perhaps to hate them, even though we would never use the word hate. People who threaten our very way of life and the things that many have been hanging on to so tightly to protect and preserve. How do we love our neighbor and follow the rules? What are the rules? What's cultural? What's traditional? What's biblical? They dealt with it in Jesus' day, just like you and I deal with it in our day. And I wanna to talk to you about that a little bit in just a few minutes. But I wanna leave you right now in this first section with a section of a prayer from Jesus who sets the tone as to, to why you and I are here, for how we're supposed to view the world around us, for the willingness that we should have to wade into the places with the people that may make some feel uncomfortable. And Jesus was offering a prayer to God the Father and he was praying and after the three years of his ministry, pouring his heart out to people and to his disciples, asking for God's protection, for his provision, both for himself and for the people he loved, for you and I. And many people misunderstand this prayer and they just pull a quote from it. And they say, well, we as Christians are supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. Have you ever heard that? We're supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. And we weaponize it in a way that allows us to use it as an excuse to live in a holy huddle, separated from the world around us, with our heads down and our heads full, waiting for Jesus to come again and hoping that nobody else really notices that we're here. Well, we're supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. And this is probably one of the concepts that I've had more conversations uh, with or around with many of you over these last couple of weeks. And I get it because it's tough. We live with rules that may or may not be biblical. 
with culture and tradition that may have misinformed us, with a command from Jesus that we're supposed to consider the world around us our neighbor, and not just to consider, but to engage. And so in John 17, Jesus does in fact say that my friends, my disciples, that you and I, that we're not in this world, that we belong to a different master, that we live according to a different code. But he doesn't just stop there. And I wanna read this to you because it's gonna set the stage for what I believe really defines how it is you and I and our church is supposed to be a neighbor. This is found toward the end of Jesus' prayer. And he says to God the Father, I'm not asking you to take them out of this world because he could, right? You get saved, you go immediately to heaven and, and you don't have to worry about it. Become a Christian, pff, all we, off we go and, and everything's, everything's fine. I'm not asking you to do that, but keep them safe from the evil one. Protect them from sin. Protect them from being influenced by the world around us. Protect them from being pulled into the current of the world and becoming a person who God doesn't want us to become. Protect them from the temptations that come sometimes from within and from without. And Jesus is praying for this protection because he knows it's not just about protecting us from the world, but preparing us for something that you and I call a mission. And he says, keep them safe from the evil one. They don't belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is true. And this last part is the part I want you to focus on. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. Jesus didn't say, just like you sent me into the world, I'm calling my friends, Christians, to hide from the world. He didn't say, just because you sent me into the world, I'm calling the church to disengage from the world. What Jesus said is, protect them as citizens of the kingdom from the temptations that may try to trap or ensnare them as I'm sending them into a world to be a neighbor to people that may stretch, challenge, and confuse. And just like the people who heard this story of the Good Samaritan, many of you may have some of the same conflicts. What's this even mean? So instead of saying that we are in the world, not of the world, what I think we should say is that we're not of the world but we are sent into the world. So since we are of the world, but sent into the world, what is our responsibility as men and women of God? What is our responsibility as we seek to be a neighbor? And if we're honest, it'll stretch and challenge you just like it has me. I confessed to the service a few minutes ago and I'll confess to you that I've been teaching this to you for three weeks in one way or the other. And this week I've had three separate occasions where I failed miserably uh, at being a neighbor and I didn't even catch it. And, and I, I had to have a conversation with myself and I said, self, you gotta do a better job. You can't stand up and teach this stuff unless you do it. And then I said to myself, well, I'm trying and that's part of it, right? And I had to literally reorient the way that I was processing and thinking about the world around me three separate times because it's just not one of these intuitive things that we get. And for those of us who've grown up with some cultural baggage where we've been given a lot of rules that aren't biblical but traditional, it brings with it some conflict of conscience that Jesus understands but came to remedy. So we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. So I got some mixed reaction when I asked the other service this, a lot of laughter, some elbows uh, and finger pointing, but I'm gonna ask you the same thing just to see if I get the same result. Do you have anybody in your close friend group or your family who you absolutely cannot under any circumstances bring up anything related to or having to do with politics or religion? 
without having an explosive conversation coming back at you. Um, everybody, you're nodding heads, you're elbowing. Perhaps maybe some of you in here are the ones that people can't have conversations with. But politics and religion seem to be explosive areas. And unfortunately, coincidentally, um, self-righteousness has a lot to do oftentimes with these two areas, politics and religion. And sometimes the most self-righteous people are the least self-aware and have no idea that people around them are terrified to talk to them because they're so determined to be right that they forget to be righteous. Right is important, but righteous has to do with relationships between you and other people. The way we live the truth, the way we earn the right to be able to share what's true, the way we influence the world around us, and far too many people for far too long have been so concerned about being right that we alienate the people around us, even if we are right, because we're not righteous at all. We're just obnoxious and no one wants to talk to us. And we call ourselves holy, warriors for the faith, truth protectors, preservers of all that's holy. All we've done is alienate the world around us that Jesus came to reach. One of the challenges that Jesus had were these group of self-righteous people called the Pharisees. The Pharisees loved to nitpick and loved to make up rules. They looked at scripture to validate their opinions. They found themselves oftentimes being surrounded by people who looked and thought and voted and drove and dressed exactly like they did. The people around them were further and further and further away and the only ones who were close to them were scarily similar, but just as vicious. And Jesus said they condemned things on the outside that they secretly practiced on the inside, that they were angry at the people around them for having all the fun and breaking the rules. When in reality, they probably wanted to break these same rules, but wanted to look holy and to be separate. And they were missing the point. So the question is, how do we live according to biblical principles like a true believer, a follower of Jesus Christ in the world that we are in without becoming like the world? Fortunately, Jesus gives us some examples. And I've mentioned to you for the last two weeks the example of Jesus calling Matthew the tax collector. And Matthew's name was Levi and Matthew. Many times in the Bible, there are people with two names. And Jesus was walking uh, along uh, just a, a street in a, a marketplace and saw a tax collector sitting at a table. He would have been a thug, an organized criminal, somebody who was the lowest of the low of the tax collectors, uh, who had turned their back on the Jewish people, who had such opposing views in politics and religion that the disciples would have hated his guts. And um, Jesus walked right up to the table, looked him in the eyes and said, hey, you want to follow me? Now, the disciples were scandalized and said, Matthew is not your kind of person, Jesus. He doesn't fit in the church. He has no business being part of our group and you're inviting him to follow? And Jesus, as he looked at Matthew, said, follow me. Would you like to follow me? And the Bible says Matthew left everything behind and followed Jesus. And then the Bible says that Jesus took him immediately to a church, immersed him in Bible study and activities, and told him never to pop his head up around anybody else that might taint him or his perspective, lest he be ruined by the world. No. Jesus said, Matthew, I'm going to lead you on a journey where you can be so focused on building the kingdom of God that you will live a life you never thought possible. And the first thing Matthew did was he threw a party. And he threw a party for his friends. He wasn't a Christian long enough to have churchy friends. He threw a party for his real friends. And these were the people who were like him. They were the people who the Pharisees, as you see, called scum. And Jesus is in the middle of the party. Jesus went to the party. There's no record of him having a meeting with friends saying, I wonder if I should go to this party. People might think I'm one of them. People might think I condone what they do. They may judge me by being too close. Jesus was never scandalized or concerned about guilt by association. He went to the party. The Pharisees, on the other hand, stood outside, judging Jesus for just being there. 
and they questioned the disciples, who I think, as I've said to you the last two weeks, were probably standing with one foot in and one foot out. I'm not sure if I can break these rules, but it sure does look like Jesus is doing the right thing. And the Pharisees said to the disciples, why does your master eat with these people? I'm really offended when he calls them scum. The disciples are like, I don't know, we'll ask him. So they holler in and Jesus says, I didn't come for the well, for those who think they're well, I came for the sick. And in Matthew, it tells us that Jesus said, you need to go and learn that what I want from you is a heart of compassion, not a heart that's so concerned about keeping cultural rules that you miss the point. So here we go. Jesus went to them. You got it? Jesus went to them. Jesus went to them. And then do you know what happened? They came to Jesus. And you might ask me how I know. And if you are paying that much attention, I want to to, to explain it to you because it's right there in scripture and it's so exciting, but we miss these things so easily. Jesus went to them, then they came to him. And in Luke chapter 15, we see another incident, totally separate, but connected. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. Do you see that? Who went first? Jesus where the religious people said a Christian shouldn't go. Around people who good Christian people said Jesus shouldn't be around. Who judged him by association. Now did Jesus sin while he was there? Absolutely not because he's perfect and holy. And as he says in the book of John 17, he prays for us that we may be in this world, sent in and protected from the evil one but we can't be salt and light from a distance. And we see Jesus here teaching in the Bible, Luke simply simply says, now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. And the way this is constructed is that it was a common occurrence. He went to them, they came to him. He went to them, then they came to him. He went to them, And then they came to him. He went to them. Then they came to him. Who went first? Jesus. He didn't build walls. So concerned about being right. Filled with political and religious hatred that he failed to be righteous. He broke down the walls and went to them being judged by people who said they spoke for God so that they would come to him. But the Pharisees and teachers of the law, they muttered and said, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And then Jesus gave three stories. I'll mention them to you quickly. The first one, 100 sheep and a shepherd. One sheep got lost, shepherd went to found him, or find him, shepherd went to him, brought him back, and you know what happened? They all rejoiced. Second story, a woman had 10 coins. One was lost, she swept the floor, found the coin. That one coin was valuable. Anyone who wanted to celebrate could celebrate with the woman. She rejoiced. Two sons, one was lost. Anybody ever lost a kid? Some of you have. I don't mean permanently, but I mean like temporarily. I was charged with watching my identical twin nephews one time at the, the, uh, where was it, in Branson, Silver Dollar City. And they look exactly the same. And they both went into the bathroom and one came out. And I thought both of them came out because they're fast and they're identical. And so when I got to our meeting point, I had one twin thinking I had both and it wasn't good enough for his mother. I had to go back and find them. (laughs) Two, two sons, one was lost. Although this twin wasn't left in a bathroom, this son looked his dad in the face and said, I wish you were dead. Give me an inheritance, all my money. I'm going to go and I'm going to waste it and do what I want. The Bible says the father scanned the horizon and waited for his son to come back. And the son getting to the end of himself decided to come back to the father and the father ran to the son and embraced him and brought him home. And they had a party and they rejoiced. Because when people connect or reconnect with God, friends, that's the point. And that's the reason that we weren't taken out of the world at the moment.
moment in time we became believers, to be a part of God's redemptive purpose and plan, not to be observers, hiding out, daring somebody to come in, meeting the standards of behavior and culture, penetrating the defensive walls of the church so that they might find Jesus. But we go so that they can come, not to us, but to Christ. In the book of John 17, I'll read these words to you one more time. Jesus says, I'm not asking you, Father, to take us out of the world, but to keep us safe from the evil one. They don't belong to the world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them by your word, which is true. Just as you sent me into the world, I'm sending them into the world. We live with the end in mind. When you and I die, we immediately go and live with Jesus. And that empowers us to live boldly and with purpose. In, in the end acronym, is that we are a neighbor to all. And when you come up with an exception in your mind as to the person you may not to be, a, uh, be a neighbor with, four or two, they're included in that definition of being a neighbor to all, regardless of how offensive we may find them or how different they may be, or how scared we are that we're a neighbor to all. And the D in the acronym I think is really important. And that is we need to be determined to build God's kingdom and God's kingdom alone. Here's a little secret. I'm only concerned about one kingdom and it shapes the way I, I teach. And it shapes the way we talk. It shapes what we do as a church. I am only concerned about building one kingdom, the kingdom of God, for the glory of Jesus Christ and his glory alone. And I'm determined that we stay focused on that by recognizing that everyone is a neighbor, going first like we do every single week with City Surf, so that they will come, perhaps to our church, but to Jesus, which is the point, living with the end in mind that this world is not the goal, that heaven's the goal. And that what we do in this life is gonna matter so much in the life to come that I wanna make it count. We're not of this world, but we're sent into the world. Let's make sure we're not so worried about being right that we forget to be righteous. Father, thank you for my friends. And I pray that as we wrestle with these truths that they would land, some maybe have this down, not an issue. Might even wonder why I'm talking about it. But I would guess that there are many who are like me who struggle with this. It's so easy to be superficial and judgmental and proud and separate. And I thank you so much for the example of Jesus. Like we talked about last week where Jesus knelt down with the woman who was caught in sin, ready to take the stones with her and for her rather than allowing her to be judged so harshly by those who say they speak for you. Fill us with your truth because it's right. But let us walk humbly in a dependent, a desperately dependent way because it's righteous. And we need your help. We want to be determined to build your kingdom and not ours for your glory and no one else's. But it doesn't come naturally to us. We're selfish people. We build our kingdom. We're short-sighted and we like the people we like. So change every part of that for your purpose, Father. Change us, change our church, change our world. I thank you for Jesus, for this powerful story and for his great example. And I pray for my friends that we could do this together I thank you for how much you love them, but Father, I love them too. I believe in my friends and I know how hard they're trying. 
And we do live in a world that sets itself up against following you. And I just pray, Father, that you would protect them from the evil one, that you would keep them from temptation, from distraction, from superficiality, from selfishness, from segregation, elitism, rule following for rule following sake, that you would break our hearts with compassion, that you would move us with mercy, guide us with grace. Allow us to be people who live in a way that points others toward Jesus and nothing else. And I pray it in Jesus' name, amen.